Hey everybody, my name is Steve Dale. I'm a board member of the Every Cat Health Foundation, which I need to explain to you. So we got some explaining to do, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, a board member of the what was the Win Feline Foundation. I don't know, 15 years, maybe longer. I don't know how that came to be that I became a board member of the Win Feline Foundation. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But first, we are now the Every Cat Health Foundation. You know what? Here's the reality. In today's world, people would Google cat studies, and maybe they would see Win Feline Foundation. But what does that mean? Now, to all of you who are involved in any way with the Cat Fanciers Association or the International Cat Association, perhaps you're a fancier, you guys know. And I'm grateful, I know I'm speaking for the board, that you have supported us for many, 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 many years. And that is a wonderful thing. But when we talk about most people in the world who have domestic short hairs, uh, they may not know. And, and the word or the name, W-I-N-N, -N, what is, you're winning for cats, are you? And you know what, our research showed, People sometimes didn't even understand the word feline. Shh, that's just between us. So we thought, okay, we need to do something about this because our goal, and I saw one of the posts somewhere, it says, well, you're only about raising more money. Yeah, we are about raising more money because we want to solve problems that still exist in cats, which brings us to today. Everycat.org, by the way, for further information about the Every Cat Health Foundation. So it was. 17 years ago or so that my cat, Ricky, who was only about two and a half, almost three years old, succumbed to feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the most common heart disease in cats. And, and maybe, uh, we'll find out if it's true in the UK, but maybe in America, uh, likely in America, the number one cause of death uh, for cats between the age of about two-ish to about eight to 10-ish before kidney disease and cancers become a bit more prevalent. Uh, it's, it's significant anyway. We don't even know what that number is because for indoor outdoor cats that just don't come back, a percent of them may have just dropped. And HCM or hypotropic cardiomyopathy often goes underdiagnosed, which I'm sure our presenter today will discuss and explain. So this cat was a very special cat to me and a very special cat in a way to America. You see, Ricky, for those of you who don't know, played the piano. I'm not gonna tell you the whole story. After the presentation, if there's time, I'm happy to, but Ricky's not the star today, and we're gonna learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy today. But when he died, I thought this piano playing cat who was on national television over and over and over, also on radio shows, because that's one thing. A dog does a stupid pet trick, jumps through a hoop. Easy to see on TV, not so easy to see on radio, but hearing a piano playing cat, that works on radio. So Ricky was also on radio. Uh, Paul Harvey, uh, those of you in America may know or remember Paul Harvey's rest of the story. Ricky was the subject of two of those. In any which case, when he died, uh, I was devastated. Uh, and even though I knew it was coming at some point potentially, uh, I said we need to do we need to do something about it. I mean, there's no magic bullet. Sadly, there still isn't. But as a result of the fund, we have raised well over two hundred thousand dollars and have made a difference in many ways for HCM. So our presentation today is important. And if we could see the next slide, uh, I, I'd like to talk about how you can help. That's text cats to this number, 833-985-2287 to give. Or you can go to the website and that's one way to give. Uh, so you go to uh, everycat.org, then look for support research into a specific disease. It's further down on the page because there's a specific fund. So I want the money to go to that fund to help HCM. Then once you go there, then you have to look for the Ricky Fund. So it says specific fund, and you'll see Ricky Fund for HCM. If you can't do it, our donor specialist, you can call. Uh, she is Lisa, and she is amazing and more than happy to help you. 
but you could also text the cats and this is or text cats to this phone number 833-985-2287 to give uh, because we we've we've learned a lot since this fund was created but we still have a long ways to go and to do that we need your help uh, so now it is my honor to introduce the speaker for today dr david Connolly, a member of the cardiology service at the queen mother hospital of animals uh, he has met the queen many times he'll tell us about that <clears throat> maybe uh, he is a european and rcvs specialist we're about to hear a lot of letters in veterinary cardiology his research focuses on heart disease in dogs, dogs, dogs and cats, and the translational potential for analogous human conditions. We're gonna learn more about that too. After qualifying from the veterinary college, the Royal Veterinary College, well, Royal Veterinary, David pursued a career in research with the Medical Research Council, having obtained PhD in molecular genetics. In other words, he's really smart. He continued research, for three further years, following a period of working with the PVSA, whatever that is in the Midlands, he returned to RVC, I warned you, a lot of letters, and completed a residency in uh, medicine services. He divides his time between clinical commitments and in cardiology service, and has a substantial research portfolio, some of which we have funded, with every cat, it is my honor to introduce and welcome Dr. David Connolly. Brilliant, thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate that lovely introduction and it's a great honor to uh, be talking to you tonight. Well, tonight, as far as I'm concerned here in the UK, um, and I'd like to you know, thank the organizers for inviting me to give this little talk and I will take things away. No, I won't because my it has frozen, so why isn't it working? I didn't do it. <laughs> it moved for your slide. It doesn't seem to want to move for my slides. You may have to somehow come out with a little technical issue. Well, um, um, I could tap dance here if you want while you look, and maybe Virginia can write you back and forth, and maybe she has some ideas about what to do. So, friends, I oh, oh there we go. I, think, I won't even have to tap yeah, dance. Yeah. You, you got it. We got it. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is obviously feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of the research we've been doing trying to understand this hugely complicated disease. What we know is that the disease in humans and cats is almost identical. So we have interest also from our medical colleagues with respect to this disease. Um, so basically the overview of our talk is going to be a brief introduction into hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And at the end of the talk, I'm very happy to you know, have questions specifically on clinical aspects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then I'm going to terrify you slightly by just trying to get across how complex this disease is. Although it's unbelievably common both in humans, young adult males in particular, um, and also in the cat population, it's a very complicated disease. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface of, of trying to understand how these genetic mutations leave the actual disease process. And then moving on from that, we're going to talk about some of the work we've been doing here at the Royal Veterinary College, um, a little bit about to further understand the genetic architecture of this disease, and that itself is proving to be far more complicated, we think, in the cat than in the human. A tiny little bit on pro modeling, and then the bulk of the talk will be speaking about our development of this cellular model uh, to try and further understand exactly what's going on in the very early stages of this disease. And again, um, this part of the work has been in part sponsored by the Every Cat Health Foundation, so that could be of particular interest. And then probably begging for some more money from you guys, we'll talk about some future work that we want to do now we've developed this model and, and our collaboration with some of our medical colleagues um, within the University of London. Now, oh, this. 
Again, my screen keeps freezing. Oh, this is not good. There seems to be some big delay between. Maybe it's the ocean between us. Can you hear me, Dr. Connolly? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, for some reason, I can't get the screen to move forward. Oh, it moved for okay. a second. There you go. Okay, Maybe. let's just see if we're going to go. So, starting off about a brief introduction to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, there we go. So, what we are aware of is that on ultrasound, which is the main way that we actually diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the cat, and these are supposed to be movies, but things are working too well at the moment. There we go. What we see is a thinning of the ventricle. So if you look here, can you see my poster? Can you see the mouse? Oh, we can. So what we can see here is this thickening of the left ventricle. And so the wall of the left ventricle is far thicker than it would be. And what this means is that the ventricle has real difficulty in being able to lack, particularly if you look at this image, you can see just how horrendously thick the left ventricle is. And so if the ventricle can't relax appropriately, what happens is we get build up pressure in the ventricle and the atrium, and that is one of the main causes for the digestive heart failure, the breathing problems we get associated um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can also get some normal movement of the main valves between the atrium and the ventricle, single mitral valve. And the abnormal movement of mitral valves will often be um, when we are to cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, not all cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have murmur, but a large portion of them do, and this is the consequence of the abnormal movement of mitral valve. That additional problem also puts more pressure on the ventricle itself and worse the progresses in some cases in these cats. And so, if you look at pathology, and this was uh, taken from a, a journal a long time ago by Dr. Phil Fox, uh, who does a lot of pathology on hydrophobic cardiomyopathy. And what it's really here to show you is to start to understand the complexity of this disease. So what we're seeing here is a cross-section longitudinally through the heart, and we can see that the pattern of thinning, the patterning of hypertrophy of the left ventral is very different in different cats. Although we keep you know, using the term hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's very heterogeneous disease. And the way that we get thickening of the ventricle in this particular case is maybe the outside wall, what we call free wall of the left ventricle that's thickened, and inside wall or interventricular septum is a normal size. Whereas in this particular cat, it's the inside the ventricular septal wall was thickened, whereas the outside wall, free wall, is of normal size. And we get this different phenotypic expression or this different pattern of expression in many cats, and the same thing occurs in humans as well. So just from a purely post-pathological point of view, again, we have a very complex disease process. If we look at the histopathology, we see some very characteristic changes. Again, similar in cats and humans. We get, you may have heard this term of myofiber disarray. So all that means is that the myofibers, so muscle cells, normally align, they line up, in a straight line, so they're all parallel to each other. And that would kind of make sense because we want the heart to contract and relax in a, in a very systematic way. But in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see that they're all over the place. They're not lining up parallel. We've got um, different muscle cells going off at various different angles. And this myocyte disarray is very characteristic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we also get a lot of fibrosis, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about fibrosis in HCM later on in the talk. But fibrosis is a major problem in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Again, it impinges upon the function 
of the ventricle. You can imagine if a lot of the muscle cells, the cardiomyocytes, have been destroyed by the disease and they're replaced by fibrous tissue, that's not going to function properly and the heart's not going to be able to function properly. Fibrous tissue, scar tissue, is like you cut yourself badly, the scar that's formed isn't the same as the skin that was once there, which is actually the same in the heart. So we get substantial fibrous tissue occurring um, in the hearts of cats, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We also some, see some changes to small vessels in the heart muscle wall, the myocardium, which further damages the whole heart. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated um, and difficult disease. So what's the result of all these things? The end result of having this thickened ventricle together with fibrous replacement, inability of the heart to be able to relax appropriately is what we kind of see in the clinic. And this is this rather unpleasant presentation in many cases where we see cats in extreme stress because they're breathing so badly they've gone into heart failure. And that's the most common presentation of hypertrophic heart and muscle. And we see this very commonly because quite low submetropolitan London, so more for the cat in our area. And these cats will come in an emergency to our emergency room in the time that they can suggest how anxious and terrified that will kids that has severe hypertrophic heart and is ingested heart failure. And they need rat and emergency management. Um, the good is the pussy actually very well and at the hospital. Um, after some intense oxygen, diuretic, and other treatments. Although it was absolutely horrible there, but it's actually quite well. So, why is that bring so badly? Well, the inflammation things, it could be because we've got bills of fluid around the lung, we call it fluid, and we see some ultrasound. So, what we're seeing here is the lung fluid is lapped up in the thorax where the lung be. The lungs are put away from all the fluid, and also the lung put away. Can't stand properly and compress by this fluid around them. Equally, you can that get fluid in the lungs? This is called pulmonary edema, and so the lungs themselves are soaked with fluid, and therefore get exchange of the exchange of oxygen across the lungs into the lungs. Dr. Connolly, can you excuse me for interrupting? If you can hear me, I think you can. If you can go by yeah. where you have videos real quickly because your sound breaks up when you have the videos on. Okay. So you could show the video and then maybe explain it after or a very brief explanation because we really can't understand. All right. Let's move on. So what I was pointing out there was the first we were seeing a cat which has got, you know, in great distress. And that was because of breathing problem. That poor cat had hypertrophic carmopathy. And I was pointing out that um, fortunately that cat did very well on intense treatment. The reason that cat was breathing badly was because of heart failure. And there's either fluid around the lungs, which is called pleural effusion, or fluid actually in the lungs, which is called pulmonary edema. We're also seeing um, an ECG where a lot of these cats die suddenly. So that's quite a compresentation of hypertrophic come up with these sudden death. So owners will have, you know, what today seems to be a perfectly healthy cat and they come down to the kitchen the following morning and they unfortunately find the cat dead on the floor. And that is often associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's a con cause of sudden death. You know, sometimes these owners feel that, you know, the neighbors poison the cat or thing, but more often the case that these cats actually had uh, underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that was never diagnosed. And the other really nasty consequence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease called thromboembolism, aortic thromboembolism. And what we see here is a clot forming in the atria. And this clot in the left atrium break off and go to the hind limbs, to the back legs, or some to the front legs actually block the arteries of the back legs. And these cats can present in extreme distress, extreme pain, because they're not getting any blood to the back legs. And obviously they're getting a smear of the back legs. It's a bit like putting a huge tourniquet or leg and, and you know that becomes extremely painful after a short period of time. So I was just showing those videos 
just to remind people of what a nasty disease it is and, and how important it is to try and understand um, the mechanisms behind this disease process. So having given a very brief overview of the actual disease presentation to both owners and to veterinarians, where, you know, this is how we see these animals as they come into hospital, I'm going to now turn a little bit more to thinking about some of the pathology um, underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and try to get a handle on what's actually causing this really um, complicated disease process. The next slide I'm going to show you is relatively terrifying, but that's not the point. The point is to really give you an idea of the complexity of the disease rather than for you to, many of us, to fully understand all the different minutiae of what's in the slide. So we know that it's a very common disease. I've explained that it presents with this big, thick ventricle, and this causes the cat to have breathing problems, to maybe just suddenly die, or to get nasty thromboembolic disease. We know the cats, in a proportion of these cats, are likely to have an underlying genetic mutation uh, of the protein which are involved in relaxation and contraction of the heart. We call these chimeric proteins. Now in humans, there's about 14,000 or more mutations have been identified in humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> to date in cats, we know of four mutations, two of which are in this gene called the myosin binding protein C3 gene. And we're going to talk a bit more about this particular gene. And one is in the myosin heavy chain gene. Um, and one is also in, a, in another gene affecting um, a protein called troponin. So compared to humans, we only have four known mutations, whereas in humans there are over 14,000 mutations. But that's not the full story by a long way, because you have cats and humans with a mutation that never get the disease. Or, for instance, in the human, they have two siblings with the same mutation. One sibling dies at 20, unfortunately, of the disease. The other sibling lives at 70 with a little bit of HCM that never progresses and dies of another disease process. So, you know, mutation alone is by no means the story. And there's a lot of other um, possibilities that we know. There's other factors called the genetic factors, which switch genes on and off, which affect whether having a mutation that results in the disease process. There are modifier genes which impact upon the first gene to decide whether it's expressed or not. There's environmental factors. One would be um, body condition or obesity certainly have an effect, and we've got some evidence for in cats. And moving on from that, there's no, you know, there's a lot of theories out there about what is the, what do these mutations, how do all these different mutations in human instance, in 14,000 different mutations in genes, result in a very similar looking hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype. So how do all these genes in different proteins result in the same disease process? And we know that in many cases it may be associated with an increase in the sensitivity of the muscles to calcium. And calcium is really important. Calcium is what drives contraction and relaxation. A muscle can't contract unless the cell is swamped in calcium. It can't relax unless the calcium is sucked back out of the cell. And we know in many cases that there's an increased sensitivity of these proteins to calcium. So in other words, they will contract at a much lower calcium concentration than in a normal heart. And that means they end up hypercracting, which uses up an awful lot more energy. And there are other processes which affect the ability of the cell to give sufficient energy and Therefore, we end up with cell dying, cell death, replacement fibrosis. So lots of complicated stuff going on. And some of this cell death can be a consequence of damage to the mitochondria. The mitochondria are little engines of the cell. They're what make the energy that actually drive the cell, allow the cell to contract and relax. And we know that there are changes in important filaments within the cell, which may also lead to damage to the mitochondria. As I said, this cell needs more energy. But because of damage to the mitochondria, we can't give it the energy it needs in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that gives further cell death. 
when you've got cell death and a degree of inflammation, inflammation is going to result in upregulation of lots of nasty mediators, which is going to stimulate development of fibrosis. As I've said, fibrosis is one of the key pathological derangements that occurs in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and drives the disease a much worse state. And that all these things work together to this poor outcome of sudden cardiac death or heart failure or this nasty thromboembolic disease. So again, I'm not the go home message from this slide is not that we're trying to understand all this in detail because nobody understands all this in detail, but is for you to understand what a really complicated disease it is and how we're making slowly but progressively um, both in the human feline uh, fields, making inroads into trying to understand what is occurring early on in this disease process that leads to those clinical signs that showed uh, at the beginning of the talk. Dr. Connolly, can so you hear little... Yeah, you're breaking up still. Can you try? We're, we're working on everything we could possibly do on our end. Can you uh, try hiding your, your, your face? Uh, which is the worst thing I can ask because people want to see your face, but that may make it possible to hear us better. Is or to hear you better. So far. Okay, is my face gone? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. You lucky people. So, <laughs> what I what I was saying in this slide, and I'm sorry that you're having difficulty hearing me, um, and, and that's that's unfortunate was I was trying to explain all the complicated mechanisms that underlie hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So although we diagnose it as a thickening of the ventricle wall, you know, that's the final stage of the disease. An awful lot is going on in the disease process to get us to that final clinical lines. And I went through a number of different mechanisms uh, and uh, uh, would lead to that final clinical lines that we're seeing. And I was just going on to say that at the Royal Veterinary College, we are particularly interested in looking at the genetic architecture. Um, and we're going to, I think, be giving another talk uh, a little bit later on in the month together with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Virginia Luis Fuentes and Dr. Androniki Fisiki, um, who are geneticists about some of the work we're doing the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats. We're also interested in this calcium sensitivity, um, where I explained that cats and humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their hearts are more sensitive to calcium, which means that they're in a hypercontractile state and use up more energy, uh, which leads to cell death. And that cell death is worsened by uh, derangements of important uh, intermediate filaments, important structural components within the cell, which actually impact on the mitochondria, the energy forming units of the cell. And again, we've done some work on that uh, at the college and shown that, that that is the case also in cats. And then what I'm going to be talking about mainly today is the pro this um, cellular model that we've developed derived together with them some funding with a number of people, but including the Every Cat Health Foundation. And finally, we talked a little bit about thromboembolic disease, that nasty disease where a thrombus um, lodges in the arteries from affecting the back legs, the pelvic limbs. And we're doing some work where we've shown that that can be a result of that regulation of a factor called von Willebrand's factor, uh, which is one of the components that may predispose to that thromboembolic disease. So we've got a wide portfolio of research going into hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, here at the college, and we're very interested in this disease. So again, just moving on, we know that when we diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the clinic, that's the end of the disease process. So when we see this thickened ventricle and this badly breathing cat, you know, the disease has been going on throughout the cat's life. And it's only when it's got to a certain stage to actually see these um, clinical consequences. So we're interested in trying to work out what's going on really early on in the disease process, well before the cat shows any clinical signs, well before the ventricle actually becomes thickened. Um, and that's really what we're going to concentrate on.
So one of the first things that we did was wanted to see whether, as was shown in humans, the heart of a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also have this increased sensitivity to calcium. And we did this work in collaboration with some of our medical friends at Imperial College London. And using this fairly artificial system, what we were able to do was to take some protein from a cat's heart and put it in the system and then introduce different levels of calcium into this system. And what we were able to do is to actually measure the amount of proteins moving, the velocity at which uh, sarcomic proteins move at different calcium concentrations. And what that told us was that cats hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, are almost identical to what happens in humans. And in all cats, and we looked at about 12 cats, in all the cats that we looked at their proteins from their heart, we found that they also had increased calcium sensitivity over normal cats' hearts in the same way that we see this in humans. So why is that important? Well, that's important because it already gives a window into potential therapeutic approaches. And what I show here also, which is a bit strange, is a cup of green tea. So, you know, we're in the UK and we drink a lot of tea in the UK. We, we increasingly drink in coffee, but still have a great love for tea. And green tea is uh, tea which has not been processed and has not been basically um, cooked, which is what brown tea is. And green tea contains a lot of um, quite important elements and quite important chemicals. And what chemicals it contains, we have shown, can actually decrease the calcium sensitivity. And so that could be a potential therapeutic way through to trying to manage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we use this system I describe in this slide um, with the element taken from green tea and show that the calcium sensitivity could be normalized uh, in these cats. And so that's a, a, a dry agent that we're quite interested in looking at further. Okay, so moving on, we're going to think a little bit about the genetic architecture. And again, I'm going to cover this briefly because we, we're going to be doing a talk more detail later on about this. But as I've already said, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a very complicated genetic architecture. We already know from our human studies, and I'm already saying that cat HCM is almost identical to H human HCM, so it's good to take information from the humans to see what we can do in cats. We know that there are over 14,000 mutations identified in humans who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they're mainly found in eight genes. That said, there's still a 30 to 40 percent of humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for which they haven't found an a causative gene yet, so you know it remains very complicated. If we take the human situation, of those humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for which they found a mutation, 50% of those mutations are found in these two big proteins, the myosin binding protein C3, the myosin heavy chain. If you remember from the beginning of the talk, hopefully you could hear me, I said in cats, of the four mutations we found so far, Three of them have been in these two genes. So to that effect, again, cat seems to be behaving in a similar way to humans. One of these particular mutations has been found in ragdolls, and we're going to talk a lot more about that in this talk, because that is where we concentrated on uh, with our model. And that's a myosin binding protein C3 mutation called the R820W mutation. And that's the mutation that occurs in the ragdoll population. And this um, mutation affects this protein here. So if you just bear with me a little bit, because this is quite important. This is the sarcomere. This is the bit of the heart cell, the, the muscle cell of the heart that's involved in contraction and relaxation. There's a bunch of really important proteins in there. One of them is this long protein called actin. The other one is protein, which is the myosin heavy chain. And this interacts with actin and basically pulls the actin chain along, which allows for the contraction. The myosin binding protein C3 gene 
encodes myosin binding protein and that helps with that interaction and so it's all involved in the contraction relaxation process. So we did some work a good while back now where we were interested to see um, whether the myosin binding protein C3 mutation was present in a number of cats that, that we're interested in. And we wanted to do this initially from a, from a protein concept. So if you've got a myosin binding protein mutation, it often causes the protein itself, <coughs> excuse me, not to form properly. So it's not as big as it should be because part of it's truncated by the mutation. But what we know from humans is that when you get this mutated protein, it's actually broken down by the body. The body is very clever at getting rid of poorly formed proteins. It doesn't allow them to be expressed in the cell. And so what you tend to get is rather than having all these truncated mutations in the body, what you get is less <coughs> of the actual protein, because all the bad proteins are actually taken away. So in a human or a cat with a mutation in this gene, what you'd expect is actually a lower number of normal protein, because all the bad protein has been broken down by the body as isn't actually expressed. And we call that haploinsufficiently. And it's been shown widely in humans. <coughs> So if we look at a piece of muscle from a human without the mutation, we get a normal level of this protein. It's very similar or greater than what we see in humans without hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that have that particular pro, uh, mutation in the myosin binding protein C3 gene, we get this haploinsufficiency because the amount of protein is less than in those humans with HCM, but in another gene, or caused by another gene, or those humans that don't have HCM. So we wanted to do a similar thing in our cats, and we looked at a number of cats, those without HCM and those with HCM, and we found that seven out of 18 of our cats with HCM had this haploid sufficiency suggesting that myosin binding protein C3 mutations, or at least how insufficiency of that protein seems to be a fairly common finding in cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Interestingly, <coughs> we did not find haploinsufficiency in homozygous ragdoll, and we kind of expect that because the form of mutation shouldn't have caused a truncating protein. So that led us on to, to say, well, we, we know we've got a bunch of these cats where we seem to have not enough of this protein being expressed and that would suggest that the there must be all these cats that have the mutation in that gene in, in the myosin binding protein C3 gene, the gene that's encoding for that myosin binding protein. And so we initially did some work to, which was called um, whole exon sequencing to see if we could identify these mutations in that particular gene. And this is a fairly crude way of doing sequencing to look for mutations, and it only looks at the exons, and the exons, the bit of the um, DNA which is actually expressed. And the bottom line is, um, looking at all these different genes, we couldn't find any mutations, even in those cats where um, we had obvious changes in the protein, that the protein wasn't being expressed at the normal level. Now, one possible answer for that, there could be a number of reasons. One possible reason is the mutations aren't actually in the exons, they're in the other bit of the DNA called the introns. And so some of our work now is to do far more complicated um, DNA analysis and genetic analysis that we can actually look far more deeply into the genes to see if we can identify uh, these mutations. And so this is work that's ongoing um, at, at the Royal Valley College at the moment. Um, and we look both at domestic short hair cats, but we're also quite interested in specific breeds. For instance, Bengal, the British short hair. We picked the short hair, not because it's British, but because it gets a particularly severe form of this disease. We, we, we see these cats present to us at two years or one and a half years of age with severe, severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, 
And we're using a number of um, in-depth genetic techniques, which we're going to, we, if you're interested, I think we'll be talking about later on uh, this month through a similar um, broadcast. Um, and looking at this in great detail, um, and we're, we're at the early stages of this work, but hope to finally get a better handle um, on what might be the genetic architecture underlying hypertrophic homopathy in cats. And I know there's other centers doing very similar things, and we're collaborating with other centers wherever we can, so we can make this as much a multi-collaborative um, progress as is possible because you know we, we're keen to collaborate and to try and do best um, across the veterinary field with other uh, researchers to try and some answers. Okay, so I said that I was particularly interested in the ragdoll mutation mainly because it had been confirmed. Um, we understand the mutation to an extent and we have a pedigree read in which uh, this mutation is relatively prevalent in the UK population. And so way back, God, a long time ago now, in 2014, we started some of this work. We did a very simple thing. Because um, a lot of these cats are genetically screened, we could contact breeders and owners of these cats and just get information about how these cats are doing, because we already had the genetic information about these cats. And we sent questionnaires um, and we had various questions. What was the genotype? Is your cat wild type? In other words, negative for the mutation? Or is it heterozygous, so it has a good gene and a bad gene copy? Or is it homozygous, it has two bad gene copies? And the owners and breeders would know this because they've got their cats screened. A bit of information about age, gender, current status, you know, Basically, is your cat dead or alive? How did it die? Did it die of a cardiac disease or was run over a bus? All that kind of stuff that you have to fairly directly to people about. Um, and we got back some really quite interesting results. And the main bit of the results was this graph here. What this is telling us, it's a survival graph. And what it's saying is that age is along the bottom here. And basically, death is down this axis here. And what we can see is that if you're a wild type cat, in other words, you don't have the mutation, or if you only have one copy of the mutation, you're heterozygous, basically you live the same for time. So a heterozygous cat lives as long as a, ho as a wild type cat. However, if you have two copies of gene, your outlook's a lot worse. And you can see each one of these drops is when a cat dies. Um, and so you can see that uh, homozygous cats are far more severely affected. We then went on to do some phenotypic uh, studies. You probably can't hear me now. There's a video, so I'll, I'll move straight on. We went on to do some phenotypic studies where we ultrasounded an awful lot of these cats. We knew their genotype, and we did some studies. And we saw that um, this is, again, seen in humans as well, that if you're male, you're going to have thicker walls. And as you get older, you're going to have thicker walls. But most importantly, that if you were positive for the mutation, then you've got a thicker ventricular free wall. And so this correlated very nicely with what we were seeing with our survival data. But homozygous cats have much poorer survival and positive for the gene gives you thicker walls. And as I've already said, thicker walls associated with more severe disease, more fibrosis, et cetera, et cetera. We also saw that if you were positive for the genotype, you had an increased amount of this substance in your blood, and this substance is um, a marker of fibrosis. So these cats, which were positive for the mutation, had increased circulating levels of a marker for fibrosis. So again, all adding to the, to the same story about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats being almost identical to that in humans. So we then wanted to look a bit more closely <clears throat> at this particular mutation. And there's been no real proper modeling of what this mutation might do. So an awful lot of um, work is done in humans and in the veterinary species to model using computer te advanced computer technology as to what a mutation might do. So you can, uh, in, say, in silico, in a computer world, you can put in the mutation into the protein and you can see how that mutation alters the structure of the protein, but also see how it alters the function of the protein. And hadn't been any work done 
for this particular ragdoll mutation on this. And we've started to do some work on this, and, and, and you know, we've gone a long way along this uh, process, uh, and we're kind of close to publication on this. So we did this in collaboration with the University of Cambridge, uh, some collaborators there who understand this technology well more than I do. Um, but what we know is that the mutation is a single base pair mutation. It changes uh, B to T, which is part of genetic code, and that results in change in the amino acid structure of the protein from arginine to tryptan. And this change in those amino acids occurs in this region, C6 region of this uh, myosin binding protein C protein. And as I've already mentioned, the myosin binding protein is important because it coordinates and helps the interaction of the myosin heavy chain with the actin thin filament. That's what actually causes the contraction, it's the interaction of these two. And this myosin binding protein C is vitally important in allowing interaction to occur. Previously, the prediction was that this mutation was probably going to be damaging, but there's not been any work done on it. And interestingly, this mutation also occurs in a human family. The, the same, exactly the same mutation was identified in a Spanish family, uh, and they also had the same phenotypic characteristics as the ragdoll. It's absolutely fascinating. Homozygous people with this mutation um, showed a poor phenotype, uh, reduced survival, and um, didn't have massive hypertrophy, but had similar type of hypertrophy as we were seeing in the ragdolls. So I'm just gonna skip over this, partly because I don't fully understand it myself. This is really high level, um, complex computer um, computation and technology. But the essence of what is going on is that first of all, the computer can make the model. And we can see this is normal G, this is the normal protein. And there's a slight alteration in the R820W model. It does cause a slight conformational change in that C6 domain. But more importantly, what the advanced computing can do, and this is a computer that's just left trundling along for 24, 48 hours to do this kind of stuff, um, it can stimulate heating and refolding of the protein. So if you can imagine, you take up, like if you get an egg and you want to fry your egg, or you want to boil your egg, the reason that the raw egg turns into poached egg is because you heat the proteins and you denature the proteins. And so the white of the egg turns from that um, non-opaque liquidy stuff into the opaque wet solid stuff because you've denatured the proteins by heating it. Well, you can do the same thing in computer simulation. And what we do is we take a water-type myosin binding protein C and the mutated R820W, put it into the computer program, and we determine the heat which causes the protein to unfold. And we can see the different stages that protein takes to refold as we drop the heat uh, of, in the compute simulation. And so when we heat, we unfold the emulation, we can see there's a significant difference between the normal reference, which is the normal protein, and the protein with the mutation. And we just look at these graphs, we can see that there's a major difference in this beta sheet subregion, which is where the mutation is. That's also affecting that loop of the protein. And when we refold the protein, we can see again, I don't fully understand these graphs, I'm not expecting anyone else to, but what we can see is that we are very different, these little yellow dots, different folded proteins. And these different refolded protein stages are very different between the mutation and the normal protein. And what we're in the process of doing now is actually analyzing each of these individual dots and making a protein model to see the different effects and different um, integrity of the protein uh, through these different models. And that's going to give us an awful lot of information about how this mutation is actually going to affect the function of the protein, how it therefore is going to affect that interaction between the actin and the myosin. So how a mutation in that bit of the myosin binding C protein lead to the uh, phenotypic changes we see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
So as I say, we, we, we're a good way through in this work. And at the moment, what the guys are doing is just, this is with a PhD student and our collaborators at Cambridge, that they're looking at these different refolded states of the protein um, to see how stable they are and see how that may then uh, affect the actual function of the protein with the mutation in. Okay, so I'm just going to move on now, particularly because this was um, some of the work that was sponsored by Every Cat Health Foundation, um, and that was this development of this cellular model, this stem cell cellular model, so these induced pluripotent stem cells. And they're an incredibly potent um, developmental tool or research tool, and again, they're being used wide, widely in studying myocardial disease in humans. Uh, both for dilated cardiomyopathy, but in particular for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's an increasing number of papers being published looking at humans with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, using this induced pluripotent stem cell technology. So what I'm going to start off with is just explain what we mean by induced pluripotent stem cell. So at the, almost at the beginning of this century, the dogma was but once a cell has fully differentiated from a stem cell into a fully differentiated cell, be that a skin cell, be that a neuron, be that a muscle cell, that fully differentiated cell was terminally differentiated. So what I mean by that is once a skin cell, always a skin cell, and you'll die a skin cell. You're not going to ever be anything else. Then work was done, which actually turned that on its head, and this was done by uh, Professor Yamanaka. This is Professor Yamanaka from Japan obtaining his Nobel Prize for this work. And what he found with his team was that if you introduce certain genes in fully differentiated cells, you could de-differentiate them back to stem cells, back to these IPS type cells, and these are basically pluripotent stem cells. And these factors, uh, the clue from these factors, are also involved in cancer. And so you can imagine that if you, you know, horrible things happen, but if you get cancer, it's because a normal cell turns into a cancer cell. But by selecting the genes in a particular way, rather than making a cancer cell, what you can do is make go backwards in time and turn your terminally differentiated cell back into, if you like, a baby neonate stem cell. What's more exciting is you can then turn those stem cells into a, any other cell type that you like. So you can have a skin cell, you can turn it back to stem cell, and then you can turn it into a cardiac muscle cell, or you can turn it into a neuron, or you can turn it into a red blood cell. And so you can do you know, some really quite exciting things with the technology. So you might then argue, well, how is that really going to help us? Well, there's great advantages because if you, ha if you take a cell from a cat, a, a skin cell, for instance, or a fibroblast from a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you de-differentiate it to an IPS cell, a stem cell, and re-differentiate it to a cardiac muscle cell, a cardiomyocyte, that cardiomyocyte will have the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, that's the amazing thing about it. You can turn the skin cell from a person or a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy into a heart muscle cell, a cardiomyocyte, still containing and showing signs of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's particularly important for heart work because, first of all, it's quite difficult to get heart cells because, you know, basically. In a cat, you've got to kill the cat to get the heart to get the cells. So, you know, that's not great. Even in humans, getting heart biopsies is, you know, difficult, requires uh, fairly invasive technology uh, and isn't without risk. But more importantly, if you take a heart cell and try and culture it, you can't culture it for more than about seven days. It dies. It's not like a fat cell or a skin cell, which you can culture and reculture and reculture and grow for months. Heart cells don't do that. The advantage of the heart cells you make from these stem cells is that you grow them long term in culture, which means you can actually do experiments on them. And that's the enormous advantage of this technology. So not only will these cells can act like hypertrophic 
cardiomyopathy muscle cells. You can grow them long-term in culture. Sorry, just having a quick drink. And that will enable you to do um, important experiments on them. One of the experiments you can do on them, which we've done, we'll explain a little bit later, is that you can either introduce a mutation, or if the heart cell already has a mutation, you can edit out that mutation. So you can do all sorts of exciting things. And that will enable you to have a load of cells, and you can start putting drugs on these cells and seeing if these drugs impact and reduce or stop the early changes I was talking about, which cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can do that time and time in with loads of different drugs and small molecules. So it's a really, really powerful technology. As always, you know, what you've given with one hand is taken with the other. There are some disadvantages, and the biggest disadvantage is that the cardiomyocytes, the heart muscle cells you obtain from the IPS cells, from the stem cells, have a very immature phenotype. So they're not the same as adult cardiomyocyte. But things moving in this direction, and we know that if we culture these in the correct way, so we put them, instead of just flat out in a Petri dish, put them in a 3D culture um, situation, and we add four to them, so we, we basically pull the cells apart, we can pretty well turn them into mature um, cardiomyocytes. So all the time this technology is improving, uh, and we're really close to making these cells um, also identical to adult cardiomyocytes. I say we, I mean the entire IPS um, um, collaborative family of people working on this, which was a massive industry. So our first plan, based on this, and this was did again with help among other people, uh, help from the Every Cat Health Foundation, um, was to take a, some skin cells from a homozygous ragdoll with the mutation, and from a normal ragdoll without the mutation, and turn these into the IPS cells, and then turn them into the cardiomyocytes. And then as I said, once we've made the cardiomyocytes, we can then you know, do a lot of exciting things with cardiomyocytes and look at the effect of drugs on the cardiomyocytes, all the things I've already mentioned. So we were able to successfully do this. Um, this has never been done in a domestic cat before. So what you need to understand is that this technology was first developed in the mouse and was then transferred to the humans and multinational organizations have put hundreds of millions of dollars and pounds into this technology to optimize this technology for mice because lots of experiments are done on mice and for humans. We were starting in our own little lab from scratch in the domestic cat and we had hoped to use a certain technique which was very successful in humans but we just couldn't get it into to work in cats so we had to use an older technique using um, a retrovirus. But that said, using this retrovirus technology and introducing these um, Yamanaka factors or these oncogenic factors, we were able to turn cat skin cells, fibroblasts, into cat iPS cells. And we did lots of studies on the iPS cells to prove that they were pluripotent, proper iPS cells, and they ticked all the criteria. And we published this not long ago in um, stem cells and development. Um, showing that we were able to make the iPS cells in the domestic cat. We then need to try and differentiate these um, cells into cardiomyocytes, because that was our ultimate goal, to um, make them into cardiomyocytes so we could do the experiments on them. Um, and this is where we ran into great problems. And um, despite a lot of optimization, we were never able to fully turn them into um, into beating, contracting cardiomyocytes. We could get them as far as upregulating lots of cardiomyocyte genes and lots of cardiomyocyte proteins, but we can never get them to go the whole way. Again, you know, the work in human mice has been going on for a number of years with big biotech industry, um, you know, spending hundreds of million dollars trying to get this to work. So we weren't able to get as far as we uh, wanted because we just couldn't get the optimization but with this technique. So that kind of put plan A a little bit on hold because we didn't use um, feline IPS cells to um, take forward this model to see what was going on 
um, in hypertrocardiomyopathy. But we're never people to, to get up at that stage. So we want to plan B. So plan B is that, again, because human HCM and cat HCM is almost identical, because the R820W mutation is in ragdolls, but it's also been found in humans and does exactly the same thing, we took a different route trying to work out what was going on. So we obtained a human IPS line from our friend at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge. And this is a totally well characterized human IPS line. We know it uh, has got no abnormal genetic abnormalities and it's been used by a large number of researchers uh, across the world. And of course, this cell line hasn't got the mutation. It's a completely normal cell line. But what we then did was using gene editing, we decided to introduce the mutation, the ragdoll mutation, into this IPS line and then turn these into the cardiomyocytes. So we have our human IPS line. We then use this what's CRISPR-Cas9 technology, where basically what you do is you cut the DNA, you snip the DNA, and using an appropriate template, you can put, produce the mutation. But so when the DNA repairs, it repairs with the mutation in. And what we achieved was this C to T edit, which gave us the R820W mutation. And it's, you know, this is a huge simplification of, of the process that's required. But you end up with lots of these different IPS colonies, some of which will have the mutation, some of which will have homozygous mutation, some of which will have heterozygous mutation, some of which won't have any mutation, some of which will have offline mutation you don't want. And so you need to take about 300 of these colonies and deep sequence them to make sure that you pick then the colonies that have your particular mutation. So we then picked wild type, we picked heterozygous, and we picked homozygous um, colonies of the IPS cells, and after a number of different optimization techniques, um, turned the into cardiomyocytes, parcel cells. And so what you see here is um, some heart muscle cells from a um, IPS from the IPS cells, which have the mutation, the homozygous mutation here, and those without the mutation. And we showed that the first thing we looked at is that did they contain our myosin binding protein D gene, which we'd expect them to. And we found that we did have a myosin protein both in the wild type, which we'd expect, but also present in the homozygous mutation. And we could see that the alignment of the actin and the myosin and the um, myosin binding protein C3 is all normal and appropriate. And that's, if you remember way back, I said that the homozygous ragdoll cat did not have less myosin binding protein C than normal cats. And again, in our cell, we proved that was also the case. So all this suggested that our cell model was acting as clear as we'd expect um, from what we knew about the ragdoll cat. And this is just a close-up of the beautiful work that my PhD student did on, on the cytology of these cells. And again, you can see that the green is the myelin binding protein C, uh, and you can see how that's aligned beautifully within the contraction elements of, of the cell. And this is actually the cells themselves, um, and you can see that we get them beating and we get them contracting, um, and so that we're now really happy that we have now a cellular model of well type cardiomyocytes, heterozygous cardiomyocytes, and homozygous cardiomyocytes. And we started doing some initial characterization of this work, and we showed that the homozygous cells were bigger than the normal cells, and we showed that the homozygous cells had different contraction and relaxation abilities than the um, normal cells. So all this was fitting in um, with how we'd expect these cells to function and act based on the fact that we successfully introduced the mutated gene into these cells. And then, as you all know, dear old COVID-19 came along and everything came to a grinding halt. Everyone went to lockdown, the labs were shut, and everything was kind of put on halt for many months. And we want to do far more characterization of these cells um, to you know, to move things, we're doing so well to move things um, further, but unfortunately COVID has 
has slowed things up to a large extent. We have been able to slowly move forward, and um, I'm now just going to finish off by explaining the future work that we're involved at the moment with these cells and where we're going to go with these cells. So the first thing that we've done is again, and thank you very much, we actually got a, a grant again from the Every Cat Health Foundation, um, which gave us some money to actually do RNA sequencing on the cells. So what this RNA sequencing will do is if we take the normal cells and we take the homozygous cells, what we can do with this RNA sequencing is really closely in examine and explore which genes are upregulated and which genes are downregulated for the different genes between the normal cells and the homozygous mutant cells. So if you can then decide you know which cells which genes are switched on and which genes are being switched off, the mutant cells compared to the normal cells, that immediately starts to give you lots of information about which pathways are being affected by this mutation. It's a really sensitive and specific way of getting a handle on what pathways are being affected. So this work um, we're doing just before Christmas, just before lockdown three here in the UK, and we're growing up the cells, extracting the RNA. Um, there's a big story of total woe associated with this, but don't panic um, every Cat Health Foundation, we have wasted your money. We sent, we extracted the RNA, everything was going beautifully from four wild colonies and four homozygous colonies, sent it in the most secure um, courier that we could find to Oxford where the sequencing would actually be done and they managed to lose the entire parcel on dry ice and everything was ruined when the parcel was discovered two weeks later. So fortunately, we had some RNA left over because we are always think about everything go catastrophically wrong. And we managed to um, have sufficient RNA to ensure that we do this sequencing. And the end result was that I trundled myself down the M40 to Oxford and uh, delivered the parcel personally to the lab to make sure um, this wasn't going to happen again. And the good news is that this is now um, in work in progress um, at the Institute in Oxford where they're doing the RNA sequencing. Uh, and then there's a big job then doing actually the biomatics, which we're going to work with in collaboration with Androniki here at the RVC uh, to identify which um, genes are upregulated and downregulated. So uh, that's a lot of work going forward, but that is in hand. We hope to go down to our friends at Imperial College uh, and do a lot more work on the calcium hand of these cells, but that's had to be put on hold for the moment because of the um, COVID issues. And going forward now, uh, work that we want to do is to further characterize these cells such as calcium handling, but also start to think about using these cells as a drug screening method, as I've already mentioned. And we've already got a bunch of um, molecules that we're interested in. What this is the gut I can't even begin to pronounce, which comes from green tea. Um, so we're interested to see how that might impact on the calcium sensitivity of these cells and what can then be put forward into a therapeutic agent. This is another calcium sensitizer um, which has been identified, which does a similar thing. This is a drug you may or may not have heard of. So this is work with beautiful, gourd work that's been done um, by James Spudage. Um, at Stanford, I think. And what this drug is, Mavacamin, is it basically is a myosin inhibitor. It inhibits some of the interaction of the myosin heavy chain with actin. And as I've said, it's that excess interaction, that hypercontractility, which is in, we know occurs in HCM, um, which this drug might be able to prevent. And there's already um, stage um, two and three trials going on in human medicine um, looking at this drug people with HCM. It certainly appears to be effective in um, people with, with um, my beta mycin heavy chain mutations. The jury's still out whether it's going to work in other mutations such as the ragdoll mutation 
the myosin binding protein C3 mutation. So we don't know it yet, but this is actually a really exciting development um, in the whole field of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And some work being done in cats with uh, Josh Stern. So Dr. Stern works out of Davis, um, UC Davis, the vet there, uh, and he has been used this drug in cats uh, and showed that it reduces the force of contraction of the heart uh, in, in the main coon colony there, which would suggest it may well be effective because the main coon can also have a myosin binding protein C3 mutation, which, which is the cause of their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So exciting times. Just finishing off, because I think you must be tired of my voice, um, we are taking this work forward in collaboration or trying to get money, <laughs> the usual thing in search, trying to get money to take this work forward um, with our collaborators at Imperial College London, which is another college of the University of London. Um, and we want to take the culture technique to a much higher level using this engineered heart tissue model. And you may remember me saying that one of the problems with the heart cells made from iPS cells is they're immature and you need to get them into a 3D type structure where you can apply force and you can add in other cells such as cardiac fibroblasts and endothelial cells basically to make model as much as close to a heart as possible in order to make these um, heart, these cardiac myocytes mature and turn into adult cardiomyocytes. So our friends at Imperial College have this technique already um, up and running and validated. So they use this advanced engineered heart tissue in the laboratory and there, I've collaborated a long time with the Imperial College people, and they're very keen to take on the ragdoll work with us, uh, particularly with my great friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, Cesare Terreano, who I work with there. And we're going to use to um, validate the our IPS cardiomyocytes in this 3D model to see how they how they change in their function in the 3D model to look at their calcium sensitivity and all these other things within the 3D model. And this will also, also allow us to see that how they react to drugs in the 3D model. Interesting, we're also very interested in looking at fibrosis. And we can use this model to study fibrosis. So remember I said one of the main problems with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the degree of fibrosis you get, which leads you to terminal disease. And you get fibrosis regardless of the mutation. It doesn't matter if it's the myosin binding protein C3 mutation or whether it's a beta myosin head chain mutation or whether it's an actin mutation. Whatever the mutation, you get fibrosis. And it's a big, big issue in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so we only use this technique, um, if we can get sufficient funding, to actually um, do a whole bunch of experiments with our cells, our um, IPS cardiomyces with and without the mutation in 3D model structure and adding in other cell cardiac cell types, cardiac fibroblasts, which are important because they're fibroblasts, that's they're what cause them fibrosis, and see how those different cell types interact and work out what mechanisms are involved that the card what signals are the the mutated cardiomyocytes what signals they're giving to the cardiac fibroblasts to make cardiac fibroblasts make fibrous to you. So there's a huge amount of work to do with all this, and it's incredibly exciting. And that's where we want to go next with um, these, this particular cells that we've developed. Um, and the end result of that will be if we can identify some of the mechanisms and some of the communication between the cardiac myocyte and the cardiac fibroblasts, what therapeutic agents, what small molecules, what drugs can we add to this culture system to regulate that fibrosis uh, exactly the same way as we, uh, as we were talking about earlier. Um, so, you know, really exciting times ahead. This is a really powerful model. It's been used, this is the first time it's been used for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats, but it's being used extensively now uh, in humans. But I have to say, I think we're in a pretty lucky position in London because there's very few labs that have the technology um, to do this uh, engineer's heart model. Um, and so our collaboration with Imperial College will, will be 
allow us to lead the game with this uh, and really take this stuff forward. And all, oh, just showing that we'd, we'd want to, in, this arrow is telling me that, or cross is telling me, you know, we'd want to try and prevent this um, fibrosis from, from the fibroblasts. Okay, that was basically all I was going to cover. Um, mainly the idea, I hope it's been of some use, some interest. Um, the idea really was to explain just how complicated this disease is, but not to, you know, get depressed. Lots of inroads are being um, taken into this disease, both at the genetic level, but also at the protein level, at the cellular level. We're working hand in hand with our human colleagues, which is really important. And the great thing is, as I've said, the disease in cats is so similar to the disease in humans. We're interested in them and they're interested in us. Uh, and that makes taking things forward uh, a lot easier. Um, and I just want to say a few thank yous. This gentleman here, uh, Dr. Luke Dutton, has done an awful lot of this amazing work. We, you know, I've had a number of PhD students in my life. And I have to say, this character here has been beyond outstanding. The man is going to be a big um, star in, in veterinary cardiology going forward. He's done a huge amount of the IPS work uh, and has helped on the sidelines of the protein modeling work. So, uh, you know, I'm standing here pontificating about all this work, where in actual fact, most of it's been done by, by Luke Dutton. Um, we've also got lots of help, again, from my colleagues at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, and uh, Animal Health Trust, which um, is out towards Cambridge, my colleague and friend Cesare Terraziano in Peel College, and real great help from Dr. Andrew Bassett and the Wellcome Sound Institute um, with help with the CRISPR gene editing advice all the time. The guy was amazing. Drop him an email, reply within five minutes uh, you know, of advice. Lots of people helped sponsor this. Yes, huge thank you to Win Stroke Every Health Foundation. We got help with IPS stuff from Boehring and Ingelheim, a wonderful company that um, are really helpful to veterinary research. Help from the Animal Health Trust, obviously funding also from the Royal Veterinary College, and some of the genetic work which is ongoing also been funded by a government, British government sponsored um, funding foundation, the BBLRC. Okay, so at this point, I'm very happy to take any questions. I think um, you here. might want to say a few other things first. Yep, I am here. So a reminder, and thank you very much for those who donated. First of all, thank you, Dr. Connolly, for an amazing talk. You can hear the applause, I hope, from thousands of people across uh, the world, or at least from me. Seriously, it's a great talk. <laughs> Uh, uh, text 833-985-2287 to give or go online and do it at everycat.org and then uh, look for ways to give. That's about two thirds of the way down the page. Click on that. We've got to fix that. I know it's a new website. So we've got to fix some things. That's one thing. So look for ways to give. Click on that. And then under funds, look for the Ricky Fund which is the name of the fund where the money goes to, specifically feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I want to get to some of the questions. We're tight on time, Dr. Connolly, so if you can make the answers brief, that would be great. Sure. This is from Yale and from myself. So I happen to know that at one point in time, some veterinary nutritionists and cardiologists in the US were working together on a potential diet for cats with heart disease slash maybe even prophylactically preventing heart disease. Uh, and specifically from Yale, is a low calcium diet beneficial for positive cats? I am going to struggle to answer that question because the answer is I don't know. I, I Just thinking about it from first principles, and again, I don't know, and I haven't read this data and I haven't read these papers, but I can't see how it could be from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The, the calcium aspect of things is intracellular calcium. And the calcium sits in a thing called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores all the calcium in the cell. And during contraction, the calcium is released from this organ in the cell, and then it sucks back up into the organ um, within the organelle within the cell to allow relaxation. Um, dietary calcium and 
circulating levels of calcium unless they're hugely old which would cause other forms of pathology i don't think are going to really that i could think of impact upon intracellular calcium so i don't know the data um, i can't think from first principles how it would work for hcm but i haven't read anything about it okay uh, first of all, I apologize to you and everyone watching because I forgot to ask you to turn your camera back on. Oh, uh, we need to see I you. Find the right button. There we go. Okay, well, you look for the button. Let me ask you about green tea. Okay, there you go. We see you. Can that be given oh. to cats from uh, Yale also? Uh, at least, if not green, well, I don't think she means serving a cup of tea, probably herbs. So I missed the question. Just come again. Oh. <laughs> Can we give green tea herbs for uh, heart support to cats? Right. So what this is was a specific molecule from the green tea, um, and that has also been shown to have antifibrotic actions as well. Um, it would. We, I think we need to do more work on it, and we need to see what effect it would have on our cellular models. What we know so far is that the protein level. Just if we just take the we actually extract the proteins from the cell, so we're going right back to the actual proteins themselves. In that model, it certainly decreased the calcium sensitivity. We the next step from that is to where we are now, which is cellular model, and we will see what effect it's going to have on our cells. And if it does similar thing, then certainly it'd be an idea to to take it into into a therapeutic level. Um, you know, in a whole animal, but it's a kind of slow process. Um, I think, you know, it, it's a concentrated extract of that particular molecule, which is found in green tea um, that we're interested in. Okay, but you, you might your, want to your cat lapping a, bit, lapping a bit of green tea isn't going to do the job. Okay, well, tea time for cats. Uh, we need to point your camera down and your face up so we can see. We only, there you go, we only saw the top of your head. Which is I very apologize. Yeah, I'm very close to my microphone because people are having trouble hearing me. But I'll, I'll oh, keep my head up as well. Yeah, I think it was just the signal interrupted by video, and then I don't know. What do I know? I don't know that technical yeah. stuff. But you are from the UK, so you know about British short hair, and British short hair breeders are asking this question: How important is it for them to screen for HCM? You know, and I will add in all of the breeds that have. Uh, a genetic predisposition potentially for HCM where we don't have the testing that we do have for ragdolls and Maine Coon with another breed soon to come. Having said that, even for those breeds, uh, how proactive should we be? And then there's the cost factor too. Sure. So it's a big question and I'm going to take it initially selfishly from a research point of view and on a wider point of view. So from a research point of view, we're desperately interested in trying to find the gene causing the disease in British short hair cats. And so to do that, what we need to do is to screen those cats using ultrasound, which have the disease, and extract DNA from them. And that's not as horrible as it sounds. It's basically getting a blood sample and getting the DNA out of the white blood cells in the blood sample so we're not having to do anything nasty to the cat apart from getting a little bit of blood but also and this is the difficult bit we need to screen old cats which don't have disease because you always need your negative control and that's the difficult bit because it's often quite easy unfortunately to get the hcm affected cats the difficult bit is getting the 12 year old or 10 year old normal cat. Why we need the older cat is because you all know HCM has variable penetrance. So you can have a cat which is phenotypically echocardiographically normal at two years old, but that doesn't mean it's not going to have HCM at five years old or HCM at seven years old. So it's no good us screen a two-year-old normal cat and taking DNA from that a negative control. We need to be as sure as we possibly can that the negative cat is negative as it can be, i.e. it's a geriatric cat which has got no evidence of hypertrophic cardiopathy. And so we're very keen to 
get samples for that. And if we could start get DNA samples from the US to, to help with that study, that would be brilliant as well. From a breeding point of view, um, absolutely, it's really important to screen your cats from a breeding point of view, but it is a bit of a bag of worms um, or Pandora's box because it's the same issue. If you screen your beautiful one and a half year old cat um, for breeding and it's negative at one and a half years old or two years old, that really isn't good enough because if you don't rescreen that cat on a yearly basis, you don't, you know, you could be breeding from that cat, you know, I don't know how long it goes on for, but through five or six years old, but this cat actually developed HC at two and a half years old, and you've only done your one screen early on in life. So, you know, it's difficult, but it's important that one of the problems that happens, has happened in the UK is that people have done a single screening in a young breeding cat. I've got piece of paper which says the cat doesn't have HCM and have taken that to mean the cat will never get HCM. Yeah. And that is something that we need to be very careful about. Do we have any idea, uh, and we're really tight on time here, but I'm, I'm curious, do we have any idea how many cats, What if there's any data at all on the number of cats that uh, screen negative, 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 and then at what age are they likely to then change over, or are there any hints that that's about to happen? It's very be dependent. So, as general, certainly in the UK, I'm like, and it's surprising how things vary between different continents. But certainly in the in Europe, it's, it's similar to Denmark. Um, pretty short hair cats, they tend to get the disease early on and quite severe. So generally, you know, it's unusual that a cat won't have it by five years of age. <clears throat> but domestic short hairs, you know, they they may not, you know, they can get late, late stage onset disease. Norwegian fox cats behave completely different from British short hair cats. So again, you know, there's big variation um, between these. I'm afraid. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> uh, I'm new at studying cat health. That was, by the way, from Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. And I thank all of you who donated. And uh, just because we're ending, doesn't mean your fingers have to end. You can still call. Uh, text or go to everycat.org and donate as I described to the Ricky Fund. Uh, this question is, I'm new at studying cat health from Nova, so I hope it's not a stupid question. Oh, Nova, not no more stupid than any question I would ask. In cats more sensitive to calcium, did I understand the doctor correctly in that these cats are more susceptible to HCM? And if that is correct, should calcium be decreased for cats with HCM. We kind of touched on that. Yeah, so, so that, that, that is a great question and I, it's important I explain it carefully. So what I was talking about was calcium inside the cell, not the calcium the cat takes in or the calcium in the cat's blood. So no, I think there's no evidence that I'm aware of that either giving the cat calcium or reducing the cat's dietary calcium will impact um, on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And certainly I've never heard of it in human medicine either. Uh, and, and I spend a long time looking at the human literature also um, because of the similarity between the disease processes. So I was talking very specifically about how the contractile protein responds to a set concentration of calcium inside the cell and what happens in HCM is those contractile proteins get very excited at a much lower concentration of calcium than would happen in a normal cell. Uh, Mava Captain, this is a question from Yale again. Uh, is this drug gonna be our silver bullet? Uh, it's now going FDA approval for human use, perhaps. Uh, that's what Yale wants to know. And then what are the odds are uh, for cats? And that I think will be our last question. Great. So, potentially, the answer is yes. I mean, we don't know if it's going to be effective for all mutations, but it's really exciting uh, what's happening in the human studies. And so, it's been looked at with people who have got this obstructive form of HCM, the HCM with the MUMA, um, and it's looked at to see if it can reduce um, the, the um, degree of contraction in hearts 
in people with, with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, I think it is going to be a major um, positive um, thing in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy going forward. And the issue is at what stage you introduce that drug. Do you introduce it in genotype positive people or cats? Or do you wait until they're actually showing signs of disease? You don't want to wait too long because if they get fibrosis, we know from mouse studies that it won't make fibrosis go away. Once you've got fibrosis, you've got fibrosis. So what stage is the drug introduced? So there's lots of questions to be answered yet, but certainly it's potentially a, a very exciting um, drug going forward. We did actually try to get a bit of the drug off the company to um, do some studies across a range of cats here in the UK. But we, we couldn't get them to release any to us, unfortunately. Mm. Uh all right, one one more here. <laughs> I can't help it, but this you know it's this cat has a problem, and if we can help, and it's hard because you're you've never seen them touch this cat. But my cat was diagnosed, and there's a lot of cats out there like this with severe HCM uh, at the age of three, just thir turned 13. Hooray for this cat uh, who has been monitored by a veterinary cardiologist ever since the very beginning. Um, Benazrapril and Clopidogrel. Did I say that right? Uh, since what? Say that again. Clopidogrel. You know, it sounds so much better when you say it. Uh, so, <laughs> do you have any ideas uh, as to anything I can uh, do for this cat? And it sounds like whatever she's doing, she's doing right. And I want the water in your house, Jan. But uh, do you have any comments, Dr. Connolly? No, I think that's great. And I think your your veterinarian's doing doing a fantastic job. Um, the clopidogrel is really really important because what that does a blood thinner, and that will reduce the chance of the clot forming. You may not remember, but right back when my movies weren't working, you couldn't hear me, and everything was going horrible wrong. I showed an image of a big clot in the atrium of a cat. I think it's about the second third slide, and that, that clot can fly off to the back legs and cause that horrible, horrible disease called aortic flow embolism. So the clopidogrel is hoping and, and probably is trying to prevent that from occurring by like thinning the blood. So that's, that's really important. Um, and it also kind of explains what I was saying a little bit about what we know in humans, that you can have two brothers, like, both with the same mutation, one gets HCM and dies, is dead in his bed horribly at the age of 25, and the other brother lives to the age of 90 and you know and eventually dies of another disease. So it, it's there's so many other factors impinged on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as uh, what pushes the disease forward because lots of cats get a little bit of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and live with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for years and years and years and die of renal disease or die of cancer. So, you know, they die with their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They don't die of their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Whereas your British short hair is very likely to die young of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there's lots of other stuff going on. With respect to your specific cat, uh, at this stage, I don't think there'd be any other drug I would introduce. Um, so if the pussycat's not in her failure, and doesn't have any rhythm disturbance, then uh, there's, there's no need to add in any other drugs at this stage, but the pedigrel is really important. Okay, so just yes or no to these uh, because of time. Uh, might Lasix help? That's from Jan. Only if the cat's in heart failure. If the cat's not in heart failure, absolutely don't give it Lasix. Can extra taurine from Kelly increase heart health? No evidence for HCM. So in the olden days, even before my time, most cats died of related cardiomyopathy because they were taurine deficient. So but unless you've got the cat on a strange diet, if you've got a cat on a normal commercial diet, the diet is stuffed full of taurine. Um, it's, it's, it's almost it's so rare now to see taurine deficient dilated cardiomyopathy in cats. And you know how we're seeing that? We're seeing that in people preparing their own cat food that aren't doing it correctly. So there actually has been an increase in dilated cardiomyopathy again. And, you know, back in the day, way before, way before my time, 
Uh, but back in the day, there wasn't enough uh, taurine in cat foods, but nobody knew that. Uh, and yeah. Uh, Dr. Paul Pion came to uh, the story goes from Dr. Pion himself, uh, a variety of different organizations, and says, "Fund me, fund me! I think I have the solution to all this. I think we don't have enough taurine in cat food." Those organizations said, ha, 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 "I don't think so." When Feline Foundation at the time said, "Your science actually looks like it makes some sense. This is possible." Well, we funded way back when Dr. Paul Pion. Turned out, Dr. Pion was absolutely right. And today in manufactured foods, because of the Wind Feline Foundation funding, he will tell you, uh, it changed his life. And it changed, of course, the lives of many, many cats who never did get, at that point in time and since, dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, surely someone else would have figured uh, it out. But it was Dr. Pion who did it, funded by us. Did you know that? That's a fantastic. I knew about Dr. Pion. I mean, I've met him and spoken to him. I didn't realize that was you guys. That's amazing because that was such an issue with cats back then. I didn't yep. realize you had done that. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm proud. That's why I'm proud to be a member of what is now called the Every Cat Health Foundation. The phone number before it goes away, please donate to the Ricky Fund. Uh, I created the fund because I do want to make a difference, uh, and uh, people like Dr. Connolly are making that possible. So once again, to you, Dr. Connolly, a thousand times thank you. But even more important than you are Virginia and Lisa from our organization. Uh, Lisa Absolutely. controls, yeah, she controls all our money, so she's more important than anyone. And and Virginia, who is producing this very event, I thank you. But even more important. All of you who joined us, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Check out our new website. Understand it's kind of a work in progress but, still. And that's every can I just say what, what, Of course. I just want to say everyone who joined tonight, thank you so much. And this is such an exciting, I'm a Brit. I don't get excited. You know, you've got to accept that Brits just sit here with a stiff upper lip. But this is... <laughs> One of the most exciting times in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy research. For years, we could do nothing. For years, you know, we were going nowhere. And now we're really, at, we're on the summit edge. We're really starting to get exciting data, starting to get exciting information, new drugs, new molecules coming out. So, guys, this is the time to donate. Shut up now. <laughs> yeah, really. And, you know, we did it with FIP. Still have a ways to go there, but we understand it better. And now there's a potential medication that's on the black market that seems to work. I didn't say what I just said, but it's real. Uh, and in addition to that, there's a medication that uh, really will work. That's just going through the FDA approval process. So now we want to do the same thing for HCM. But like FIP, we wouldn't ever be able to do that without your help. So here I am uh, sitting here begging for you to help because that's what we need. Once again. Dr. Connolly, I'm sure we've not heard the last of you. Thank you so much, and please give our regards to the Queen. Also, stay healthy. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. <laughs>